thank you all for joining us today. Um, I know you're trickling in, but we wanted to kind of get this program started. So thanks for joining the launch of the Public Health Service Deployment Safe Synchronous Training. My name is Abby Lowe. I'm faculty at the University of Nebraska Medical Center and the director of the US Public Health Service Deployment Safe Training Program. This infectious disease series over the next three months um, focuses on specific diseases. In today's globalized society, infectious diseases pose a significant threat to the health and safety of the world's population. While we have dealt with many infectious diseases throughout history, emerging or re-emerging pathogens can spread at a much more rapid pace than in the past. The US Public Health Service Commission Corps' role in healthcare delivery, research, regulation, and public health response makes them uniquely positioned to support outbreaks of any origin. So today, on behalf of the U.S. Public Health Service Commission's Corps and Public Health Service DSAFE program, we're happy to launch the Infectious Disease Webinar Series as a key training opportunity. Our time today will focus on monkeypox. A quick overview as we begin. First, we have opening remarks by the Director of the Commission Corps Headquarters, Captain Richard so Schobitz. Then we'll turn it over to Dr. James Lawler to give an overview of monkeypox transmission and infection prevention. And finally, we will hand it over to Commander Danielle Mills to talk about key deployment safety considerations. I have a few housekeeping remarks, mostly about continuing education. So this slide highlights a few things about the webinar, as well as giving you the CID number, which you'll need for continuing education. This next slide is just kind of scopes out that the University of Nebraska designates this live activity for a maximum of one AMA category one credit. Thank you. The University of Nebraska Medical Center is jointly accredited by the Accreditation Council for Continuing Med Medical Education and the Continuing Accredi Accreditation Council for Pharmacy and Medical ed Education. This is our disclosure slide you can see there. And finally, for, continuing med for the continuing medical education um, close out, here's what you need to do next, the important stuff. So after the webinar, you'll sign into the UNMC My CCE portal at the website shown there. We'll also be following up with some of this information in the chat as we go through the webinar today. On your dashboard, click Evaluate Activity and then enter the activity code. So hopefully that gives you a sense of what to do next and that this is a webinar that gives you CME credits. Now to get started, I'd like to turn the meeting over to the Director of the Commission Corps Headquarters, Captain Richard Schobitz, for opening remarks. Over to you, Captain Schobitz. Thank you, and good afternoon, Public Health Service officers. Welcome to our first session of the Monthly Deployment Safety Academy for Field Experience webinar series. For those of you I've not had the opportunity to meet yet, I wanted to introduce myself. I'm Captain Rick Schiffitz. I'm your director of Commission Corps Headquarters, and it's an honor to, to be in that role. I'm excited to be with you today as we kick off this important webinar series. I'd like to start off by acknowledging our training branch, who's worked tirelessly to bring you these training opportunities to support your deployment preparedness. I'd also like to thank the University of Nebraska Medical Center team for their great partnership in developing these trainings. Finally, I would like to thank each of you for taking time out of your incredibly busy schedules in order to participate in this valuable training. The DSAVE training is a collaboration between the United States Public Health Service and the University of Nebraska Medical Center. The training course is intended to provide a baseline knowledge for our officers who may be deployed to highly infectious disease environments. As you're certainly aware, working with infectious disease has been a focus of the public health services service since our origins within Marine Hospitals in 1798 and as the Consolidated Marine Hospital Service in 1870. While I love our history, for the sake of time, I'm gonna move us forward to more recent work with infectious disease, including our work in West Africa for Ebola in 2014, our historic efforts to support our nation during the COVID-19 pandemic and our ongoing efforts, which include, but are not limited to both COVID-19 and Ebola. 
And yes, we do have efforts ongoing with Ebola and we have uh, officers right now engaging in protecting our nation. You have taken the challenge to serve your nation and really the world when public health, public health crises emerge. It is my sincere thought that you deserve the best possible preparation to safely deploy when needed. And this DSAFE course is a critical training component to lead toward that preparation. I highly encourage you to sign up for additional web-based modules as well as in-person trainings in the future, both within DSAFE and other opportunities we are working to provide you. The DSAFE course module has been designed to fit similar trainings used by the Administration for Strategic Preparedness and Response, or ASPR, and the National Disaster Medical System, or NDMS, emergency response teams. To ensure that this training meets our officers' unique deployment needs, the planning and course development for this training includes feedback from experienced public health service officers who participated in on-site pilot testing sessions. And actually, there, there's been more than one of those. There's been several. Please be aware that CEUs and clinical practice hours will be awarded for all aspects of this training. The training is also open uh, to officers of all ranks and categories. So please encourage your colleagues to participate in future trainings. I'll now turn it back over to Ms. Lowe, who will tell us a little bit more about the module and introduce you to some of the experts in the field who will be helping us to enhance our skills. Thank you, Ms. Lowe. Thank you, Captain Chobitz. So as Captain Chobitz mentioned, there are three modalities of training that we're launching with the DSAFE program an asynchronous course, which is completely online, um, and you'll, you'll be able to access um, through your CCLMS, a two-day hands-on on-site course here in Nebraska, and then the webinar series, which you're currently attending today. So the synchronous training, which is that webinar training that we're currently um, on right now, will we'll focus on infection prevention and control. Um, our, our launch is on a range of infectious diseases over the next two webinar, three webinar trainings. You'll learn about different um, infectious diseases from experts, both in infectious disease preparedness and response and key safety issues from public health service officers as well. Our asynchronous training is a prerequisite for the on-site training, but it's a self-paced online standalone course in itself. The training again focuses on key infection prevention and control principles. Our on-site course is um, the space where you'll have the practice, being able to take those infection prevention and control principles and um, Don, Doff, better understand the limitations of PPE, as well as participate in hands-on simulated training tailored to deployment settings. So we're looking forward to seeing so many of you over the next few months in, in some of these training modalities. So with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker who's going to give us um, an overview of monkeypox transmission. Um, today, J Dr. James Lawler, who's an executive director of international programs and innovation at the Global Center for Health Security, is going to be kicking, a, kicking off um, the infectious disease training, um, speaking about monkeypox. So over to you, James. Thank you, Abby, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak with such an august group. So uh, I thought it would be helpful for the 30 minutes that we're going to be talking about monkeypox transmission. Obviously, uh, I'm speaking to the, the U.S. Public Health Service. You guys have extensive background in infectious disease and infection control and prevention and a, a rich history, as uh, we heard uh, uh, Captain Shobitz say. So um, I, I thought it was really worth taking uh, a, a graduate level approach to what we're going to talk about for transmission and some of the evidence behind uh, what are the recommendations and a, a lot of the gaps that currently exist and um, to allow some nuance in assessing risk uh, based on what we know. And so a few takeaways, I think, that will be uh, helpful to keep in mind as we're going through today's uh, webinar. First, is monkeypox is still really a new disease, right? This is not a disease that we have extensive experience and history with. Obviously, we've been getting a crash course over the last uh, five or six months, but this is um, really important to keep in mind. There's a lot that we still don't know about the disease and particularly how it's been presenting with this current outbreak. The second is to understand that 
Um, rarely in biology and nature is there a single answer or are things uh, binary or very easily categor uh, categorized. They exist on a spectrum. And that's also true of monkeypox transmission. Uh, monkeypox is probably transmitted by multiple routes. Uh, and that mucosal exposure is probably an important route, as is inoculation. But that inoculation probably requires some degree of non-intact skin. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. And then lastly, again, just to reiterate, we don't fully understand the, the immunopathology, uh, the mechanisms of transmission and, uh, and disease. And those who speak with certainty about how the disease is transmitted and, and what, uh, what we should do to prevent that transmission, uh, those really aren't experts and you shouldn't listen to them. If, if uh, if people claim to know a lot about this disease, then then again, they're they're probably wrong. And there's, I think, very few people who have uh, a very broad understanding of, of the scope of risk. And, and I think most real experts would would be humble in telling you there's a lot that we still don't know. So first things first, this is where we are, and I'm sure you are all aware of, of the current status of the epidemic. We've uh, thankfully peaked uh, globally and in, in the US. And so uh, as you can see, that was uh, around uh, the beginning of August where we saw our maximum number of cases and we've been falling since then. Uh, nevertheless, we're still seeing more than 50 cases uh, per day diagnosed in the US on average. As you can see, our total is over 26,000 cases uh, for uh, the entirety of this epidemic. And it's likely that transmission and community cases will continue for a long period of time. We're going to see a very slow kind of exponential decline at this point as, uh, as it becomes harder and harder to clean up uh, these uh, various pockets globally. Globally, again, we've had, I think, over 72,000 cases now worldwide. And again, I think the same uh, phenomenon is being seen in, in Europe around the world. So uh, obviously a, a huge outbreak, uh, far eclipsing any previous uh, counts of monkeypox that we've seen anywhere else in the world. And so uh, the, the extent of our knowledge about this particular outbreak and how the disease is presenting here is, is still only a few months old. So uh, just a, a quick background about pox viruses, uh, again, things you probably already know. I think uh, maybe cocktail party trivia, things of interest that uh, I can impart you with is the fact that these are the largest uh, of all human pathogenic viruses, uh, and they are the only one of those human pathogenic viruses that can be seen under a light microscope. Uh, so they are uh, quite hardy, chunky, big things. Uh, they are DNA viruses, which is important to know because that's uh, very distinct from RNA viruses like uh, SARS-CoV-2, where mutation rates and um, uh, and um, genetic changes are are relatively rapid. DNA or they're like the sloths of uh, viral evolution. They move very slowly because DNA is so much more stable. Uh, it also means because of their DNA genome and their uh, envelope and hardy capsule, they survive uh, very well in the environment uh, and potentially for long periods of time. Uh, and on the left there, that's actually a, uh, a uh, light micrograph from, uh, I think, AFIP, which uh, shows you some of the guanieri bodies and inclusions that include um, viruses under the light microscope. So uh, one thing important to keep in mind about the taxonomy and uh, kind of the genomics of these viruses, uh, all of the viruses in the genus Orthopox virus are very closely related uh, and they are um, able to elicit cross-protective immunity, which is obviously really fortunate for us because that means we can vaccinate somebody with a live vaccinia virus and protect them against um, smallpox or monkeypox or any of the other members of uh, the orthopox virus genus. Again, those are the main human pathogens we see from orthopox virus there. Uh, including monkeypox, cowpox, vaccinia, and variola, uh, again, the cause of smallpox. Um, and so the, the takeaway there is, I, I think, cross-protective immunity and genomically relatively similar viruses. So a lot of what we have known about pox viruses up until now, particularly the orthopox viruses, and much of what we thought we knew about the pathogenesis of these viruses really comes from smallpox because it was for um, much of the 20th century. 
three, the most prominent uh, of the orthopox virus infections, and, and also obviously a huge public health threat uh, and a uh, subject of research uh, in the eradication campaign so we could understand the disease and help to eradicate it. And so that, I think, shaped a lot of our thinking about monkeypox uh, throughout the latter quarter of the 20th century and for the first 22 years of, of this century. And so um, variola, or the virus that causes smallpox, or sometimes the name of the disease, uh, really had two forms. But the major form, the classic form, had a mortality of roughly 30%. And you can see that gentleman there has what is classically uh, described as uh, variola major. Uh, and so um, lesions throughout the body concentrated on the face and then the extremities, and, uh, and uh, again, a 30% mortality. Um, and monkeypox cases that were recognized early in Africa appeared very similar to this. And if you see some of the pictures that um, I had planned on putting in here, but I actually think I uh, omitted, uh, many of the, the children from uh, Zaire, uh, now DRC, where the first monkeypox outbreaks were recognized, looked very similar, right? They had rash distributions and, and confluence of rash, a number of lesions that were at least uh, approached uh, this gentleman here. And so again, that shaped a lot of what we thought about monkeypox and what we knew about uh, its transmissibility as well. So uh, again, this is summarized in what is really the, the Bible of smallpox and, box, and pox virus disease from the 20th century, which was from Frank Fenner, one of the uh, kind of uh, grand masters of, um, of pox virus and, and smallpox disease describing monkeypox. And you can see it; its clinical description looks very similar to that of variola or smallpox with these generalized rash lesions that occur all over the body, uh, pretty uh, you know, high level of systemic uh, symptoms, uh, and um, <clears throat> a, a disease, again, that had uh, clinical similarity very close to that of smallpox. Um, you can see that the, the reservoir there, which is uh, all still uh, the accepted um, dogma of the community, that it probably is animal reservoirs, especially small rodents, ground squirrels, and things like that, that are the uh, natural environmental uh, host for these, and probably the, the source of species jump into humans, which is generally how all monkeypox outbreaks had been identified, uh, again, up until this current outbreak. Uh, monkeys seem to be probably an accidental dead end host and probably very unusual in terms of their root, uh, uh, in terms of their importance and leading to transmission to humans. But again, the takeaway is uh, previously you had thought monkeypox looked a lot like smallpox. And if you look at uh, kind of the pathogenesis explanation uh, in Fenner, um, it's a similar story. And again, this is really still best frames what we know about the, the pathophysiology and immunopathophysiology of uh, orthopox virus infections. Um, and as you can see from the quote that I pulled out there, essentially Fenner says that um, you know, the cases of monkeypox that have seen been seen uh, up until now, which again were primarily cases described in Congo, uh, really look similar to smallpox, and uh, and that's uh, how they're best described. And if you go on the left, that little cascading diagram shows you uh, kind of the immunopathogenesis of the pox viruses uh, and how they are acquired and how they progress through the body. Uh, and you can see that's uh, shown to be similar from uh, virus to virus. So Echromelia is uh, an orthopox virus that infects mice. Uh, vaccinia, you know about, and uh, variola, you know about. And in variola, they described two different routes of infection, either uh, the mucosal route of infection, which is thought to be the natural way that smallpox is acquired, uh, generally into the oral or nasal or upper respiratory mucosa. And then they do describe inoculation smallpox, which was previously uh, uh, a condition known as variolation, where you would intentionally introduce into a wound. Uh, and that's also how vaccinia smallpox vaccination occurs essentially right with the bifurcated needle uh, up until recently. Um, and you get this very um, um, predictable cascade of events that goes from local inoculation, uptake uh, on the mucosal service, uh, surface, transportation back to the local and regional lymph nodes, 
then you get uh, virus dissemination in the bloodstream, which is a first phase of uremia, which then seeds uh, the larger organs of the, uh, the lymphatic and immune system, like the spleen and other lymph nodes and uh, liver potentially as well. And then you get wider spread uh, across uh, through the bloodstream into other organs, which eventually deposits the virus in skin and back in mucous membranes. And only then do you start to see the actual uh, pathognomonic lesions of pox lesions, which pop up on the skin and mucous membranes. And that's one of the reasons why the incubation period of uh, classic smallpox is relatively long, right? An average of 12 days uh, to go through that entire process. Now, uh, it, it seems that in inoculation smallpox, that's somewhat short-circuited uh, with more acute involvement in the regional lymph nodes. But again, the, the idea here is, is for most pox virus infections, uh, it involves dissemination through the bloodstream. Uh, it involves systemic il illness from that widespread dissemination and then replication in multiple organ systems. And that's why you see lesions in uh, smallpox popping up in multiple locations. Um, and that was classically described in traditional monkeypox, especially in uh, the Central African variety. Um, noticeably not necessarily true in vaccinia, right? Where primarily the, the lesion uh, at the site of inoculation tends to be the only lesion uh, associated with vaccinia and only uh, relatively uncommonly did we get uh, disseminated uh, lesions with vaccinia uh, smallpox vaccination that were actually uh, true replicating virus uh, remotely. And so uh, did indicate that with vaccine, at least the, the rate of viral dissemination through the bloodstream was much lower. Uh, so important things to keep in mind as we're thinking about what happens with monkeypox. So I, I think then based on what we know uh, historically and traditionally with pox viruses and what was determined from epidemiological investigations uh, with monkeypox, again, primarily with outbreaks in uh, uh, the Congo Basin uh, with that now called clade one or Congo Basin uh, strain of the virus, um, it is uh, essentially most probable that uh, infections of monkeypox were transmitted uh, through inoculation uh, into oral or respiratory mucosa. Again, most uh, cases of monkeypox in uh, those areas are actually probably from jump from an animal reservoir into humans. It's primarily kids uh, who actually get uh, infected in those uh, countries, and it's thought because perhaps they have more contact with the environment and then uh, frequently are sticking their hands and their nose and mouth and eyes, and that may be a route of inoculation. Human-to-human -human transmission of monkeypox, again, previously was very rarely described, a and when that happened, most human-to-human -human chains uh, ended abruptly after one or two generations of transmission. Very few went beyond three generations, and I think the longest ever recorded prior to this current outbreak was, uh, I believe, six generations of transmission. So essentially, it wasn't thought to be something that was easily transmitted human to human. Again, it was kind of direct, uh, probably from the environmental reservoir, again, probably into uh, the onto mucosal surfaces in kids, but probably also uh, through, uh, again, inoculation in a non-intact skin. Now, also important to uh, point out that for smallpox, certainly, uh, droplet um, and potentially aerosol transmission was clearly documented, uh, and aerosol transmission, at least in a couple of cases, so this is uh, the most famous episode of uh, airborne smallpox transmission that occurred in a German hospital in 1970. Uh, it won't go into too much detail, but I, suffice it to say there was a, a gentleman who'd returned from uh, a, a trip abroad and had been incubating smallpox, was admitted uh, to the influenza ward of a hospital because there was a flu outbreak going on at the time and they thought he had flu. And it wasn't until several days into his illness when he developed uh, kind of the prototypical rash of smallpox did they recognize that and then began, first of all, to move and isolate him uh, and also to do investigations and to vaccinate everybody in the wing. Um, nevertheless, uh, by the time they realized that and had taken 
uh, there were 17 secondary cases of smallpox that uh, were acquired in that wing. Many of them, as you can see, quite remote from that person, many on different floors. So even on the, the patient, as you can see, was isolated where that red arrow is, the index case, but there were cases on the second and third floor, even a case in a visitor who came into the anteroom lobby uh, and stayed for 15 minutes talking to somebody and left. That shaded area is the result of a smoke test they did to then look at the uh, air uh, um, movement patterns, smoke movement patterns from that patient's room afterwards, trying to recreate the uh, conditions, environmental conditions, and showing that the, the location of the secondary cases tracked very well with where the, the smoke traveled when they uh, released that within the patient's room. So seems to be very good documented evidence that there was widespread airborne transmission over long distances with uh, smallpox. Now, what was unique about this patient somewhat is he did have very prominent pulmonary symptoms and had a cough when he came in. That was not as common with uh, smallpox is, uh, that was not one of the more common features of smallpox, what was occasionally seen. But again, it does point out that the virus does uh, get shed from mucosal services of the respiratory tract, and it can be then disseminated in aerosol particles that are generated from that lower respiratory tract and infect people over long distances. And so it's thought, at least theoretically, there might be uh, the possibility of monkeypox being transmitted that way. So this is where we have been really and were nine months ago. This article actually was published in PLAS uh, NTD in February of 2022. So it represents kind of the state of the art thinking of the epidemiology of monkeypox virus at that time. You can see that they, they put some maps of where recent cases have been described. And so really for the last 10 years up until Recently, most cases, again, described in uh, the Congo, you can see almost 19,000 cases over that 10-year span. So that means mostly uh, clade one or the Congo Basin clade. Uh, and then there had been uh, an increasing number of cases described in Nigeria. You, you can see over 160. But still, um, the very much dominant form of the virus was thought to be uh, clade one or Congo strain, which, again, is a much more severe virus. Virus 10% quoted mortality versus the 1% to 2% quoted uh, for the West African clade or clade 2. And obviously, the West African clade is what we're encountering here. Uh, so this uh, next slide shows kind of the evolution of that uh, epidemiology and the understanding of that over many years. The top map is from the first decade of when monkeypox had been uh, discovered and, and started to be tracked. And again, that's in the 70s. And you can see uh, even then they were able to recognize that there was a different uh, strain of the virus circulating in West Africa, which milder disease, but again, was encountered much less frequently. Most of it was described in the Congo. And then you can see from the early 2000s, the first decade of the 2000s, again, uh, primarily disease encountered in DRC, but there was this one anomaly of a virus being exported out of Africa and into the United States. Uh, so we had this large outbreak of um, monkeypox of the West African or clade two variety uh, in 2003 associated with animals in pet shops, mostly prairie dogs. And this was traced back uh, to the importation of a giant Gambian pouched rat that was infected and infected other prairie dogs. Uh, and this form of the disease had a much different appearance. Again, seemed to have mostly uh, lesions confined to the hands and the extremities. They were generally only a few uh, lesions limited in scope with some systemic symptoms, but people weren't really that ill. And so very different from what had been described in the West African form. And again, mostly concentrated in areas of the extremities where you think people probably had direct contact with their animal pets. Some had actually been bitten and scratched. And so there was a, a noted break in the skin and kind of exposure, but for some there, there weren't. Uh, noted breaks in the skin. So how that transmission route occurred is, is really still a question, but seemed to be probably much more likely to be related to direct uh, contact with those animals. And so this is uh, an example of what many of those cases looked like. Again, isolated lesions, uh, you know, a, a cluster of them on the hand, maybe on the arm, some with regional lymphadenopathy. Many had systemic symptoms, as you can see, almost 90% uh, had a fever at some point. Uh, many had respiratory symptoms, or it's 
Uh, many had respiratory symptoms, as you can see. So there were more generalized symptoms than I think people may have really uh, noted or, or realized back then. So kind of gives this mixed picture. Is it more or less systemic disease like traditional clade one monkeypox had been described, or is it really more of something uh, local uh, that is really just from uh, inoculation and, and, and is an infection that really involves only the local tissues and, uh, and lymphoid organs? And this is what we're seeing now, obviously, which looks uh, much less like the classic monkeypox, again, described from Central Africa, and much more like the limited form of monkeypox we saw in 2003. Part of that may be that it is the same clade now, clade 2, so typically causes a, a less severe disease. But I will point out, and again, if you go back and look at that Plaza NTD article, uh, even clade to West African monkeypox is still described as having about a 2% case fatality rate and most people becoming pretty uh, significantly systemically ill. So uh, it's not a clear picture. And, and that also relates to what does that mean about the route of transmission? Um, unclear. A lot of folks, as you can see, have lesions that are distributed widely, even though they're not highly concentrated from the face and the extremities. And in many ways, they resemble the distribution where that face central face area extremities are most prominently uh, affected and the trunk is relatively spared, which is how smallpox and uh, systemic monkeypox typically behaves, indicating that there's probably viremia and dissemination through the blood. And that means that multiple organ systems can be seeded. Um, but many have lesions concentrated in the genital area, which is thought to be the source of inoculation. So it still is somewhat unclear. So what we're seeing now resembles a lot more um, some of the other pox virus diseases, which were well known, but not thought to necessarily uh, mimic what we see with orthopox viruses. So uh, ORF uh, and cowpox are other pox viruses. Again, cowpox is an orthopox virus, which we know more as kind of localized diseases with the severe ulcerative lesions, sometimes with systemic manifestations as well, like fever, but not thought of as disseminating the virus across multiple organ systems and throughout the body. It's generally confined to a site of inoculation, and again, thought to be uh, you know, localized to where there's skin damage. And, and there's other diseases that are similar to this, right? Herpes, uh, traditionally seen as uh, herpetic whitlow or herpes gladiatorum uh, are direct inoculation forms of the disease with herpes simplex virus. With herpetic whitlow, it's thought to be usually during uh, through little lesions that often are at the perineke of the, uh, you know, the edge of where your skin meets your nail bed. And with uh, herpes gladiatorium, that's in wrestlers who uh, wrestle each other and grind each other's faces and body parts into slimy mats that contain the herpes virus. That probably induces enough skin trauma to facilitate viral entry. Uh, but there's not a lot of diseases where kind of direct viral inoculation into intact or seemingly intact skin uh, is able to transmit disease. Usually you need a mucosal surface or a, a break in the skin to really get transmission. Uh, but certainly the, the viral lesions of monkeypox seem to mimic kind of this uh, stereotypical progression of viral lesions of, of smallpox. And this is uh, an example of the monkeypox virus lesions and what they look like. And notable that within that fluid in the lesion itself, uh, on the surface of that lesion, and even within the scab, uh, as the scab forms, there is high concentration of virus and all of that virus is potentially viable. Even from scabs that have separated from people and have been found uh, in places people uh, apparently would collect smallpox scabs and envelopes for some reason, you can actually grind that scab up, resuspend it, and isolate viable virus from that. So there's lots of viable virus that's potentially infectious in these lesions. So uh, in addition to other sources of virus dissemination, the skin lesions themselves certainly are one. And so this gets us to kind of what's the modern picture, right? This is essentially the modern uh, graphic of what that Fenner uh, graphic from the 1970s was uh, showing how the virus gains entry. Again, here it seems that it's through the respiratory mucosa uh, or through a, a wound or a break in the skin. And the virus gets taken up by antigen presenting cells. It goes back to the lymph node. It replicates there. It can disseminate to other organs eventually. And that's why you can get shedding from the mouth or from uh, you know, virus presence in semen, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Interestingly, this doesn't really mention um, 
sexual transmission or introduction into genital mucosa at all. It assumes respiratory mucosa. And I think that's one of the gaps that, again, we've probably overlooked and seems to be pretty clear based on the data we have now. Uh, I don't think the virus discriminates so much in terms of the mucosal surface, surface that it uh, prefers to enter in. And in fact, I think this recent outbreak seems to indicate that it, it is really very happy entering through the genital mucosa and uh, probably is also highly concentrated in genital secretions which probably lend uh, to uh, this high incidence of sexual transmission that we've seen. So uh, what do the data tell us from uh, this current outbreak? Again, I think one of the most uh, striking aspects of the epidemiology of this disease has been the fact that it is almost exclusively in male. Certainly there have been uh, you know, anywhere from five to 10% in most of the studies that have been out there of, uh, of people who are not adult men uh, who are uh, affected, but it is overwhelmingly the majority are men, and overwhelming the majority are uh, men who have sex with men, as you can see here from this uh, large study uh, from the UK Health Security Agency. 97% of their cases in this uh, particular survey were men who have sex with men. So I, I think, you know, overlooking or glossing over the fact that this is sexual transmission really doesn't make sense. That seems to be the root of transition in the majority of cases. And again, it, it's probably uh, more the, the mucosa of the genital tract and, and probably a bit less than the skin, although certainly there's opportunity for skin-to-skin uh, -skin contact and, uh, and, and maybe disruption of the normal skin barrier uh, with uh, sexual contact. Um, also true that, uh, you know, I think mucosal contact uh, obviously is still playing a role in potentially respiratory mucosal contact, at least in some cases. I think particularly in the cases where transmission has involved people who are not men in the men who have sex with men community, uh, again, in household contacts and children, uh, et cetera, this may have been a prominent route. Uh, and even with monkeypox, there is some compelling evidence that there might be mucosal transmission, droplet transmission, potentially even airborne transmission over distances. This was a study that was done in prairie dogs a few years ago. Uh, and in one of these experiments, they house these prairie dogs in separate cages. Now they were only separated by an inch and they had little holes in them uh, to allow for air to, to flow between the two cages. Uh, the, the researchers admit that it is possible that the prairie dogs were able to kind of squeeze their noses through the holes and touch noses uh, from cage to cage, but that's probably unlikely. And this seems to indicate uh, that there was at least large droplet airborne transmission that could go through the holes from cage to cage, but probably more likely smaller droplet airborne transmission that can kind of fly uh, between the, the different cages and find the other animals. So again, it seems at least in some instances, there can be uh, droplet or airborne transmission with monkeypox. Uh, and what we see in human cases now is uh, a, a very common detection of the virus uh, in places other than the skin and lesion, which is, I think, where most people kind of concentrate and think. And so this was a, a very good study that was done in uh, Spain in 12 patients looking for monkeypox uh, by PCR in saliva and other uh, clinical specimens. Next, and what you can see in this study uh, is... Uh, pretty common detection, again, across all of these folks and at pretty high titers, right? If you see a, a CT value of 17.6 uh, or 18 from a rectal swab in that one patient, low CT means that you have a lot of virus there because the PCR has to cycle fewer times to amplify the DNA. And, and regardless what assay you're using, a, a CT under 20 is a lot of virus, right? So uh, there's a lot of virus flying around in these folks. And it's not just from their skin lesions, right? It's from their mucosal services. It's from their saliva. It's in their semen. Uh, it, it's from nasopharyngeal swabs, as you can see in a number of those cases. So potential routes of infection, uh, you know, all of those. And, and again, very high concentrations in some of those uh, body fluids uh, or uh, body compartments. This has been replicated in other studies. Uh, and uh, Again, even potentially in asymptomatic individuals. This was a study from Belgium and folks coming into a, a sexual health clinic. And again, showing that even in folks who were not currently symptomatic, <clears throat> uh, they were able to detect virus from uh, rectal swabs uh, from um, uh, these patients. And again, you can see weeks um, <clears throat> after having their uh, original uh, 
sample uh, and, and original detected infection. And so what this means is these folks are really kind of a, uh, a, a wash with monkeypox virus when they are infected that not only is shed from the skin and the lesions directly, but also from uh, upper respiratory secretions, saliva, uh, in um, uh, stool, uh, right? And so they manage to contaminate their environment uh, quite easily. And you can see this is one study out of Germany looking at uh, the environmental spaces around patients with monkeypox and noting that there are relatively high concentrations of virus, uh, specific, specifically looking at high touch things like the TV remote control door handle, the sink faucet, right? The places that we know um, uh, pathogens are, uh, human pathogens are often concentrated. Uh, and again, often pathogens that are associated with fecal oral transmission or potentially from skin, right? You get it on your hands, you touch these things and they become contaminated. Uh, this has also been borne out in other studies. And again, this was a very good study that came out of the uh, Royal Free Hospital in London, looking at PCR in multiple surface uh, uh, surfaces in the environment of uh, patient rooms in five isolation rooms, also in the air and also on the PPE of healthcare workers who came out uh, after doffing. And I'm almost done. I've got a couple of minutes. I think we'll be okay. So here are some of the sampling sites they did. If you see the, the letters A and B on the table and on the desk and cupboard, those are where air sampling sites were. But again, the circles are where uh, environmental surface swabs were taken. And you can see they found virus all over these rooms in all of these places, right? And again, um, in, in some instances, not at low concentrations, right? You start to get into the middle of 20s. Again, you're, you're seeing, uh, you know, that's real amounts of virus. And again, also in the air sampling, uh, and particularly they did during uh, bedding changes. And we, and we know that in smallpox, at least, linens and, and bedding was a, a potential significant source of fomite transmission. So this was uh, more data that they got from that study. And I will just point out that some of these folks were many weeks from their initial onset of illness, right? So it's not just early on in the course of infection that you're potentially infectious. It can be later on. And you can see that orange arrow on the right points to PPE, right? Get gloves, gowns uh, that were worn by uh, healthcare workers in the room. <clears throat> when they come out and they take those off, those have virus on them, right? And again, uh, in, in that one case in room B, a CT of 27, and, you know, that's, that's a fair amount of virus that they detected on that glove. And so reinforces to us that, that fact that we wear PPE for a reason. It's protecting you from that uh, uh, pathogen in the environment. But PPE is also a potential threat and source of infection. And doffing is really important in terms of doffing meticulously, carefully, and according to protocol so that you don't infect yourself with the contamination on uh, your PPE, which uh, often happens. And that's why we say doffing is really the most dangerous part of uh, isolation care that we do. And so the last thing to talk about is a study that just was recently published in, in EID. And it, it uh, details uh, a healthcare worker uh, exposure and infection that probably occurred uh, in a house visit uh, by these two healthcare workers in Brazil. So these were uh, two healthcare workers that went to visit a gentleman uh, in Brazil who'd been sick for about a week with genital lesions and systemic symptoms that seemed very consistent with monkeypox. So they visited this gentleman's home uh, and uh, you know, as they were trained, they were uh, very careful about putting on their PPE. So they put on their N95s, they put on their goggles, uh, they put on their gown. Uh, for some reason, they did not put on their gloves. Uh, and, and that is uh, that, it, difficult to explain, but they uh, figured, I guess, while they were sitting interviewing the patient, they didn't need to wear gloves. And so they were gloveless for 45 minutes in the patient's room in his bedroom where he was lying, uh, sitting in chairs, touching things with ungloved hands. Now, they did san they did use alcohol uh, hand sanitizer, and they uh, at least decontaminated their hands, put on gloves to take the specimens took the specimens, nasal swab, put them in uh, their packing and container, sealed them up, and then apparently doffed their gloves and cleaned their hands. But um, <clears throat> uh, disturbingly, did not think that they needed to take off the rest of their PPE. So they wore these uh, now, you know, almost certainly contaminated gowns uh, and uh, and goggles or visors and uh, N95s that they had been wearing in the patient room. and. Uh, returned to the laboratory wearing all of those same things with all of the equipment and gear that they'd had in the patient's room. And so um, 
doffed those only after they got back to the laboratory. And uh, six days later, both of them had developed lesions and, uh, and, and illness. And so I think this is a great example uh, of uh, why we uh, focus on appropriate donning and doffing and use of PPE uh, and why uh, especially safe doffing seems to be such an important aspect of that. And again, I think highlights the fact that this idea that um, we understand fully the modes of transmission of monkeypox, probably not true, right? Because these pers these people did not have direct skin-to-skin -skin contact with that person and didn't really have what would appear to be a very significant exposure at all until you start looking back at some of those data we talked about talked about in terms of environmental contamination, where the virus is shed from in people, and how you can potentially acquire. So that's where I'm going to stop, and uh, I'm going to turn it back over to uh, to Abby, and uh, Abby, sorry for running a couple of minutes over. Fine. Thank you so much, Dr. Waller. We're going to go ahead and now talk about the key site safety considerations for public health service officers, and to do so, we have Commander Danielle Mills, who is an industrial hygienist, and in Agency IMS Safety Officer at the CDC. Danielle, over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, as Abby mentioned, I'm Danielle Mills. I currently serve as the Incident Management Structure Safety Officer for the CDC, where I conduct risk assessments and help prepare CDC responders for safe and successful deployment missions. So today we're gonna to talk specifically about site safety considerations and what PHS officers need to know about monkeypox on deployments. So the deployment process is inherently risky. We're changing a deployer's working stable environment, putting them into something or some place different, doing things that they may or may not do reg regularly. So there are, are different risk factors on deployments. And there are four basic principles uh, that form the foundation of risk management. So risk is anticipated and managed by planning. Uh, we make risk decisions at the right level. We do not accept unnecessary risk, and we accept risk when the benefits outweigh the costs. So you've already heard about the current science. Um, so just as a quick refresher, pox viruses are sensitive to most disinfectants, household cleaners, detergents, and other methods of disinfection or sterilization. Um, for the majority of our PHS deployments, we need to be aware of these key steps to preventing uh, monkeypox. So in terms of fomite transmission, if no cleaning or disinfection actions are taken, low levels of monkeypox monkey virus can survive on surfaces in household settings for at least 15 days, primarily on textiles and fabrics that are in frequent direct contact with the person with monkeypox. In a recent study conducted by the CDC, live virus was not detected on surfaces in the home of persons with monkeypox who were regularly cleaning laundering and disinfecting high touch surfaces. Uh, the, good practice is, the good practice of covering rash with clothing or bandages may have also contributed. So here are some of the scenarios that you need to be aware of uh, for monkeypox. Um, by congregate settings, think hurricane shelters, group shelters, maybe the UAC missions or work in BOP or similar settings. As a general rule, unless you're supporting a lab or a healthcare setting, the main hazard is not necessarily going to be monkeypox. And it's also worth noting that there are not going to be a lot of engineering controls, so we have to rely on administrative controls. So those policies, those standard operating procedures, cleaning and disinfection, and personal protective equipment. So let's talk about congregate settings. Uh, there are some things to think about when uh, pertaining to monkeypox in congregate settings. Um, some of the areas of concern for those congregate settings, especially during setup, are going to be uh, waste management. So generally, management of waste should continue as normal in those facilities, and they should com comply with state and local regulations for the handling, the storage, the treatment, and the disposal of waste. Um, it's important to incorporate good cleaning and disinfection techniques, especially in the common areas. If you do have... Um, monkeypox identified, you're going to need to isolate those residents away from others to the extent as possible until there's a full healing of any rash formation um, with a fresh layer of skin, which typically takes about two to four weeks. Um, they should have a dedicated laundry space uh, that should be identified for the residents in isolation if you have them. Uh, facilities should work with their state, local, um, tribal, and territorial health departments to identify and monitor um, 
for the health of any staff or residents who might have had close contact with somebody with monkeypox. And contact tracing can help identify people with exposure and help prevent additional cases. However, this might not be feasible in all settings. So you can consult uh, with the, an exposure risk assessment uh, recommendations available from the CDC to identify um, who've had a high degree of exposure to someone with monkeypox, wherever that's possible. And the state, local, tribal, and territorial health departments can provide uh, post-exposure vaccination for people with a high degree of exposures. And in facilities where contact tracing is not feasible, staff and residents who spend time in the same area as someone with monkeypox should be considered to have an immediate, an intermediate or a low degree of exposure, depending on the characteristics of the setting. So think of like the level of, of crowding um, and those shared spaces. And post-exposure vaccination is not necessary usually for low or an immediate degree of exposures unless deemed appropriate by the state and local health department. As a recap, state, excuse me, site safety considerations for monkeypox include um, ensuring access to hand washing, soap and water and hand sanitizer of at least 60% alcohol should be available at all times. Um, anyone who touches any kind of rash or the clothing, the linens, the surfaces that may have had contact with a rash should wash their hands immediately. We'll need to provide the appropriate personal protective equipment for staff entering isolation areas. And we always recommend having a buddy um, to assist donning and doffing of that personal protective equipment. And um, employers still have to comply with OSHA standards as far as bloodborne pathogens, personal protective equipment, respiratory protection, and any other requirements um, by the state. So as you're getting ready to deploy, think through the types of risks that you may encounter. Could there be um, interaction with the general public or it could be direct patient care, possibly environmental sampling. And then think of the actions needed to stop the chain of infection. So if it's a barrier that's needed like indirect patient care, then PPE may be your key. And do not forget about COVID-19 precautions as well as your good basic health and hygiene precautions. And here I've listed some of the resources from the CDC that are good to consult in preparation for your deployment. And I wanna thank you for your time and attention this afternoon and I will hand it back over to Abby, thank you. Thank you so much, Commander Mills. I wonder if we, we do have a couple questions in the chat. I wonder if we might be able to just take one of the those and see if either of Danielle or James might be willing to answer them. Um, one, one of the questions is, are there any EPA approved or waived disinfectants for monkeypox? Commander Mills or, or Dr. Lauer, is that a question that either of you would feel comfortable answering? Danielle, if you take that one, I'll take the treatment question. <laughs> okay, sure thing. Um, so as a general rule, yes, um, EPA has said that um, the, the same disinfectants that are effective against COVID-19, so that would be the end list, those are also effective toward uh, monkeypox. Great, thank you. And James, do you want to take the, the treatment questions? Or I will there... take the treatment question. Yeah. So um, there are a, a couple, uh, a, well, a couple of things to point out. First of all, um, not necessarily treatment, but in post-exposure prophylaxis, the vaccine probably is uh, effective in preventing disease or at least uh, reducing disease um, even after you've been exposed, right? So that's something else we know from uh, orthopox virus uh, diseases and smallpox and vaccine in particular. If you are exposed and you get vaccinated soon after that, and, and we like to have that happen within 72 hours, but probably out to a week, uh, that vaccine probably imparts significant protection against developing disease. And if you do develop disease, disease will be much less severe. So that's kind of step one. <clears throat> there is post-exposure prophylaxis uh, that works primarily with vaccine. There are other options, but uh, we won't go into that now. For people who are ill and, and who are manifesting symptoms and have lesions, th there is now a, a treatment uh, that is actually FDA approved for smallpox, for variola infection, 
but it is being administered under an expanded access IND uh, currently across the country. And that drug is called Tecaviramat. Uh, it was uh, recently added uh, to our armamentarium into the strategic national stockpile again for smallpox um, in 2018, I believe, is when it was approved. So that drug has been used now in, in thousands of patients. Um, it, it is um, so far, anecdotally, um, uh, you know, potentially uh, resulting in uh, earlier healing of lesions. Um, and it's being used uh, principally in folks who have either severe disease, so widely disseminated lesions more systemically ill, or have lesions that are in sensitive areas or potentially at risk for significant scarring or causing other problems. We've had lots of people with genital lesions, with proctitis and rectal lesions that cause uh, in, inability to stool or inability to urinate or uh, the potential for uh, deforming scarring uh, to occur. And so for those patients, tecaviramat is, uh, is an option. Uh, again, FDA approved for a different disease, varila, but if you look at the animal model that was a little study to approve it, it was an animal model of monkeypox virus infection. So uh, lots of evidence, uh, at least beforehand, that this would be an effective treatment for monkeypox. And so far, uh, what we've seen, again, kind of anecdotal, but large uh, amounts of anecdotal data are pointing to the fact that it is tolerated well and, and seems to have uh, good effectiveness. And maybe one last question that I think you've touched on, Dr. Lau, in different ways, but how much protection against monkeypox is there for someone who received the smallpox vaccine many decades ago? That also is kind of the million dollar question. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, unclear, I, I think, is the best answer. I, I, I think based on what we know about um, smallpox uh, and the protection against smallpox with uh, vaccination, that protection seems to have long lasting effect. And, and so even if it doesn't prevent you from getting infected, uh, the mortality in people who had been vaccinated even decades before uh, was significantly lower. Uh, and, and this was probably best seen. And there was a study of imported cases into Europe uh, and then uh, Europeans you know, who were infected, again, people who had not encountered smallpox uh, in the past um, and only explanation for protection was vaccine. Vaccination. And again, the data seemed to indicate that even those who'd been vaccinated more than 20 years earlier had a much lower mortality rate. And so uh, it is true that the vaccine probably gives, uh, in many people, lifelong protection against more severe disease. But again, doesn't mean that you're not going to get sick uh, and you wouldn't benefit from revaccination. So uh, kind of the, the standard um, the, the standard guidance now is for people at high risk of exposure, uh, you know, should be vaccinated uh, every three years. So laboratory workers, for instance, who are actually working with uh, pox viruses in the lab uh, are vaccinated uh, every three years. Well, thank you so much for that. And thank you to our speakers today, to Dr. James Lawler, to Commander Mills, and to Captain Schobitz for launching this webinar series with us. We appreciate that. And thank you everyone for your time and attention.